introducing Buddhism by talking about the phenomenon that happened to mankind uh, in the 6th century and the 5th century BC. It's a very strange phenomenon that many scholars have attempted to explain. And that is the emergence of extremely deep thinking people who created revolutions in human thinking and in religion. And they, it all happened within 150 years, all over the world. <clears throat> you can see the names and the dates of the people on the blackboard. <clears throat> In China, there were Lao Tzu and the founder of, or the, the uh, accredited founder of Taoism, Confucius. In Greece, a number of great thinkers, starting with Thales of Miletus, the father of modern Greek and uh, modern thought, uh, the first person to challenge all accepted thinking in tradition, uh, and of course followed by Heraclitus and Socrates. Uh, why did they all live? all over the world in this short period of time? Uh, it's a very interesting question, which many people are still trying to answer. Uh, the most obvious answer is that it's an evolutionary phenomenon coming from the development of writing and the accumulation of human knowledge. But a, a more uh, extreme view is that it may be due to external influences. Uh, these ideas have been put forward by a number of thinkers, notably by Velikovsky, but supported by some great scientists like Einstein. And that is the possibility that radiation from outside, uh, possibly from sunspots, uh, in, in affected the human brain during that period so that a number of brains developed uh, with greater facility and greater number of connections than later brains. Uh, this is a curious phenomenon involving Einstein because Einstein's brain has been kept and studied in Canada and it's found that he has twice the number of connections of the average human being in his brain. So uh, there, there may be some way in which uh, phenomena can create that uh, extraordinary brain. Be that as it may, uh, the thing that these thinkers had in common was that they challenged accepted thinking. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the way in which the Lord Buddha did that. The Lord Buddha was born a prince of a small kingdom in the Himalayas. He was educated, he grew up in a life of relative comfort, married and had a child. And then in, apparently in his 20s, he suddenly decided to abandon it all and become a beggar. And he traveled throughout the length and breadth of the Ganges, looking for people who could give him thinking, thoughts that were provocative. In, stimulating ideas and could enlighten him for he was searching for the meaning of human life for the meaning of creation now that is of course the basis of Hinduism it is a study of the total meaning of all creation uh, but and the search for truth and for enlightenment, the search for the vision of uh, an existence which is external to us uh, and is eternal, that is of course the basis of Hinduism. So to begin with, the Lord Buddha was not departing from Hinduism, but he began to do so as he became uh, more and more resistant 
to organized religion, and in particular to, to two aspects of Hinduism which he couldn't accept. One was the caste system. Now, as a, a prince, he was actually in the second caste, for the highest caste were the Brahmins, the priests. And princes were always under the, the thaw, thrall of uh, orders from Brahmin priests. Uh, but that is uh, not likely to be the reason he rejected it. It is much more to do with the creation of a material value which was not eternal, which is not meaningful. He disapproved of the idea of equality, and he disapproved of it in principle. If material things are important, then it is not uh, significant that we are uh, making a distinction between the importance of different human beings. So to Buddha, everything became equal. He rejected any kind of distinctions in society. And he also rejected the distinctions between men and women in society. He rejected the principle that women were subject to men. And he also organized, he also rejected the idea of organization of religion. He believed that religion was something personal. And one should confront the challenge of understanding existence internally as a personal challenge and not in terms of any kind of institution. <clears throat> so he wandered as a beggar, getting food where he could from kind uh, hosts, and ended up uh, in his late age uh, at an area, in an area of Benares, where one day, deep in thought, under a shady tree, he suddenly experienced enlightenment and began to understand the meaning of everything. The tree he sat under was called a Bodhi tree, B-O-D-H-I. <clears throat> From then on onwards, the Lord Buddha continued his travels as a beggar, now much more respected as he began to be realized, it, be, it began to be realized that he was a great seer, a, a very uh, fine, uh, deep person, and he began to teach a, a group of followers the importance of a personal religion in which the, pers the search for personal enlightenment would be the only goal in life. There was no other goal that was important. Because he was seen as a leader, he felt the need to try to develop some rules that would lead them more easily towards the enlightenment that he had achieved. And so the rules began with the need to speak correctly and never mislead people. <coughs> To have aims in life which uh, avoid all aims which are incorrect. Uh, to undertake actions which are positive and not negative actions. To earn a living in a way which pr brought no harm to any other human creature, including animals and birds. to tr strive throughout one's life to do the right thing. To try to think clearly 
and well and not think wrongly. To focus attention at all time on these goals and never to be distracted from them. And so what I've given you in a very general term are the eight paths to enlightenment that are attributed to the Lord Buddha. And he felt, felt that uh, everybody searching enlightenment should be aware of four essential truths, which he called the four noble truths. The first is to accept life as suffering. To accept that the offering of our suffering comes from within us because we are searching for the wrong things in life. Or if we are searching for the right things, we're not doing that in the right way. The third of the noble truths is that it is possible to eliminate suffering if you shed unnecessary desires in your life. And the fourth noble truth is the importance of reaching enlightenment. Nothing else mattered. No material thing is of any value or importance. <clears throat> now these ideas of the Lord Buddha were not written down so there are no holy texts in Buddhism except texts which were written much later and that do not come from the Lord Buddha. His followers, often very thoughtful people, tried to write down some rules and some parables but fundamentally there is no one holy book which Buddhists accept as central to their belief. What the Lord Buddha was aiming at was the simplest religion that a human being could achieve. <clears throat> and these goals were taught by him to his followers throughout the Ganges Valley and eventually adopted by some of the rulers in the Ganges Valley where there were a number of small kingdoms. Uh, and of course the Hindus, the Brahmins particularly, strongly objected to this rise of a new religion and there began a series of wars throughout the Ganges Valley between these kingdoms. Uh, now the first architectural challenge to the Lord Buddha came when one of the great kings, one of the main kings in the, in the Ganges who was defending Buddhism was killed in battle. And uh, as a, a great uh, a friend and ad adherent of the Bo Lord Buddha, it was felt by the Buddha's followers that this king should be given a fitting memorial. So what architectural memorial could be built as a tribute to him? Now that's in its present form. It is, of course, 2,500 years old, more, 2,600 years old. So it's thought that it is only what's left of the memorial, that it was larger originally, taller probably. But it, fundamentally it was that kind of memorial, that is it was a mound of earth plastered over. And that is the only architecture that the Lord Buddha is known to have approved of during his lifetime. In the foreground of this slide, you can see there's a white circle around a mound of earth, a small mound of earth. <clears throat> now that is identifying something which is worldwide as a phenomenon from prehistory. And that is the way of paying respect to your parents, your grandparents, your ancestors when they die. In traditional societies in many parts of the world, 
you created a mound of earth over their ashes. They were cremated and then their ashes were put in a bowl or a vase or a jug and that was buried inside a mound, a small mound of earth. The reason it's so close to the house is partly affection and partly because uh, it was thought that as they were reincarnated, they would bring protection to their, their descendants and bring protection to that household. <clears throat> and so this, there was this tradition which the Lord Buddha had grown up with of commemorating uh, someone who died with a mound of earth. And all that the Lord Buddha did was to increase the size to commemorate the importance of the person who was being honoured. Inside such a mound, sometimes they're faced with clay, sometimes they're faced with plaster, sometimes they're faced with stone. <coughs> and inside there was nearly always some sort of a small chamber where the ashes were placed in an urn. So we get a very good uh, indication here of what the Lord Buddha would have thought about architecture. And that is that it should be as simple as possible. He was against any kind of material display. Now, when the Lord Buddha died, a great mound was erected, of course, by his followers to commemorate uh, how important he had been as an influence in their lives. Uh, and this mound of earth was, was then faced with stone to protect it. 200 years later, a great uh, emperor, who was, of course, a Buddhist, because Buddhism gradually spread throughout the northern India, called Asoka, one of the greatest of all emperors in history, <clears throat> one of the most enlightened. Asoka decreed that the urn containing the Buddha's ashes should be opened from the original uh, mound of earth <clears throat> and the ashes divided into 12 parts and sent to the furthest limits of his kingdom of northern India so that 12 memorial uh, mounds could be built to commemorate the Lord Buddha and each of these would become a pilgrimage site for the followers of the Buddha. And so here is one of them at Sanshi. The most, uh, the original one and it's thought and the most historic one is in Benares on the Ganges. This one is in Sanshi. It was enlarged in size over the centuries but basically it's the original form of the stupa by that time. That is about 250 BC. And it has, uh, you can see, a raised platform from which the stupa rises and around the edge of the platform is a railing which allows people to, which indicates that people are allowed to circumambulate around the stupa at that level. And flights of stairs lead up to that railing. At the top there is another railing which surrounds the symbolic shrine of the, the tomb of the Lord Buddha, that is the urn in which the ashes are placed. Actually we know that they are placed much lower down in the stupa, but this is a symbolic uh, container for the urns surrounded by this uh, railing at the top. And above that are three umbrellas. Why three? Of course, the umbrella is an honorific, isn't it? We know in ancient Persia and in other ancient civilizations, uh, the king, the ruler, and the chief priests would always have an umbrella carried over them. <coughs> so it's an honorable thing to be shaded by an umbrella. But the Buddha merits three umbrellas because of his great influence on society. <clears throat> the whole enclosure is approached through a gateway. You can just make out the gateway in the middle of the slide. It has three beams over the top of it, just to, to echo the three umbrellas over the tomb of the Buddha. And there's another railing around the whole enclosure and so 
the way in which a pilgrim would pay respect to the Buddha would be to enter through the eastern gate, that is the gate of where the, the direction of the rising sun, and circumambulate to the north, to the west, to the south, and back to the east. Uh, and then go in, uh, inside the enclosure, up the stairs onto the raised platform and circumambulate again in the same way. And this circumambulation was the physical active way of paying respect to the memory of the, the Lord Buddha. Now, why would there be other mounds? Ah, because the Lord Buddha had also taught uh, that followers who were anxious to benefit mankind should, if they could, after retaining uh, enlightenment, turn back to teaching as he had done uh, and forego the chance of escaping reincarnation by continuing to live for another decade or two as teachers. Uh, these uh, disciples, these followers of the Lord Buddha, who turned back from reincarnation, from being escaping reincarnation, I should say, they are called bodhisattvas, the followers of the Lord Buddha. And bodhisattvas also merited some honorable tombs. And so we not only get a large mound uh, when we have the 12 sites with the ashes of the Lord Buddha, but we also have smaller mounds around them to commemorate each of the bodhisattvas. They generally merit only one umbrella. Now there were 12 of the sites that had the ashes of the Lord Buddha. But there were afterwards, as Buddhism spread, uh, there became, began, began to be more sites. So how did they solve that problem? Well, it, legend has it that it was solved by taking the teeth from the skull of the Bo Lord Buddha and allowing each of the new great sites of Buddhist worship to have one tooth, a Buddha's tooth. So we believe or the adherents of Buddha believe there is a tooth of the Buddha in Burma and a tooth of the Buddha in Sri Lanka and so on. I should explain that the great emperor Asoka was so convinced by the teachings of the Lord Buddha that he resigned his kingship in the middle of his reign and became a beggar in the forest. And so it was his children who had to spread Buddhism and they went out to Sri Lanka to what was then Ceylon, and to Burma, and to other places, to Nepal, to spread the message of Buddhism. <clears throat> and so uh, Buddhism became very strong in quite a large area of Southeast Asia. As time went on, the message that materialism should be avoided was slowly played down and people started to honour these sites by embellishing them. And so the railings began to be decorated. Uh, the decoration was often so beautiful uh, in, of course, an, a late Hellenistic style because of, of the power of the Greek Empire over Indian culture at this time, uh, that uh, many of these railings are now in museums and not on the original sites. But such a railing would date from about the first century BC or the first century AD, very late. Because before that, Buddhism uh, and its escape from materialism was so strong that decoration like this was not acceptable. Now here is the site at Sanchi with the great stupa. Stupa is the word for the biggest of the mounds. Very small ones are called dagabas. But here is the great stupa, uh, and in the background, you have monastic buildings. 
Now I should explain that although the Lord Buddha didn't want institutionalization, he also wanted to have to protect and help people who were trying to devote their lives to meditation and not to making money. In other words, there would be communities of people who were very poor and needed help. And so he urged people who were seeking enlightenment and retiring from the world to join a monastery of like-minded people who would live together and beg together for food every day. And there were monasteries for men and monasteries for women. And he urged people to build them in areas which were already protected by the community, like the areas around the stupas. Uh, so that's why the, there are monastic buildings here. There's also a strange building to the right of the stupa with a sort of uh, curved roof. And you've actually seen it before. We talked about it when we were talking about the uh, hall house and the way in which boat roofs began, began to be used as they reused boat timbers, and perhaps for symbolic reasons. So here is a boat roof, uh, perhaps, over a chaicha hall, a hall for meditation and for discussion. Uh, not in the original, its original form for prayer in our sense of the word, for the Buddhists didn't pray. There were no gods. They were only searching enlightenment. So it is not a hall for prayer. It is a hall for discussion and thought and meditation. Notice the clan is very symbolic. It is a mandala of the simplest kind. And it has four axes in the four directions, the four cardinal directions. And notice how the how it is all aligned perfectly. <clears throat> now, as Buddhism developed after 500 years, you start getting some huge stupas built, particularly in the more remote areas of Buddhism, like uh, Sri Lanka, Burma, Nepal, Tibet. Some very huge stupas. This one is 550 feet high and is in Ceylon, Sri Lanka, at Anurajapura. And look at the scale of the uh, treasury at the top, the, the shrine which contains the ashes, symbolically. Uh, and look at the scale of the umbrella. It is no longer just three umbrellas. It is a cone of 13 umbrellas, one above the other, broken off, of course, in this uh, stage. And now we're going on in time, uh, and we have a... a stupa, which is quite small, but surrounded by a, a large base. And this stupa dates from about 800 AD in Sri Lanka again, in Polonarua. So here is a chaicha hall. We have only a small number of chaicha halls surviving, because the idea of a meeting just for meditation and debate and discussion uh, eventually was replaced by shrines for prayer. I'll come to in a moment. So the number of chacha halls surviving is very small. We have those which were cut in natural rock, which we saw in the previous lecture. And here is one of the few surviving above ground. I, I wanted to point out that the, you see the squares in the center that looks like, like, looked like an altar in an apse is actually a small uh, model of a stupa to remind one of the Lord Buddha and uh, his enlightenment. There's one other feature about these sacred sites, and that is that they nearly always had an ablution pool, not surprisingly, for the tradition of cleaning before entering a sacred area was obviously very important still. Now, there were a, were a huge number of rock-cut uh, sanctuaries, including chacha halls, and also including uh, places for refuge. They were monasteries, in a way, in which one had a chance of escaping the, the, the rain and the cold. Uh, and many of them were rock-cut. 
and luckily they survive quite extensively in India. Later on, these rock-cut shrines or these rock-cut shelters become very elaborate and have uh, highly decorated columns and even representations of the Lord Buddha and other associated deities. Now the Lord Buddha becomes a kind of deity at that stage. Next. And sometimes these caves become multi-storied, still cut in natural rock, and obviously representing that originally there must have been three or four storied built monasteries. Now the growth of decoration is an interesting issue and is related to a problem. Yeah. Sorry, um, what sort of rock was it? Sandstone, a lot of it. Okay. Very, very uh, good for carving. <coughs> the related issue is the fact that the pra Brahmin caste hadn't disappeared. <coughs> the, the one caste that was really resistant to conversion to Buddhism in the whole of India was the Brahmin caste, for they had a lot to lose by giving up their, their rank and their importance in society. <coughs> so the Brahmin caste <coughs> survived <coughs> and continued to uh, produce holy manuals for Hinduism, uh, continued to preach Hinduism and to practice it, even in strong Buddhist communities. <clears throat> After about 400 years, uh, they began to ex ex exercise quite a strong influence on the uh, Buddhist communities that had by then become uh, very uh, traditionally uh, institutionalized, you might say. They'd become very uh, less concerned with the great sacrifices that were involved in the early ages of Buddhism. And so as Hinduism grew and came back in force in India, the Buddhists felt a need to counter it. And it seems that at that stage they accepted some major changes in Buddhism. One was <coughs> that the Lord Buddha could be revered as a kind of a visible saint. And they brought back the idea of an icon image of a person who was a demigod, if you like, the Lord Buddha, to whom one could pay respects and from whom one could ask uh, help and benefits. And, and so for the very first time, around 100 BC, they began to represent the Lord Buddha. And until that time, the Buddha was never represented except by an empty saddle on, a, on a, an elephant or a, 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 some sort of animal vehicle. Uh, until that time, the Lord Buddha was always an empty seat, perhaps with a hat. And then suddenly, about 100 BC, he gets represented as a kind of idealized Hellenistic god, um, an ideal man squatting and receiving enlightenment, which is often shown as a kind of flame or eye in his forehead. <clears throat> and this idea of representing the Buddha as in, and placing him in a shrine so that people could come and pray and ask for help started to grow. <clears throat> and at the same time, uh, they started to introduce more decoration into Buddhist buildings so that they began to compete with Hindu buildings, which of course were very ornately decorated. Uh, and slowly as Buddhism went on, uh, in the attempt to defeat Hinduism, they had accommodated themselves more and more to Buddhist ideals to, and to Hindu ideals and took over Hindu ideals into Buddhism. Uh, so you get a new kind of Buddhism which involves worship and prayer. And that is not generally regarded as the same kind of Buddhism as the first kind. In other, in other words, the kind of Buddhism introduced by the Lord Buddha himself is called 
the lesser vehicle, the vehicle which wasn't ornate, which wasn't material, which didn't have representations. And that is the Hinyana, sometimes in a modified form called Sarala Buddhism, but usually called Hinyana. Uh, and then from about 100 AD, uh, in the handout it says 500 AD, but that's by the, t the time by which it was consolidated. So from 100 to 500 AD, you get the rise of the greater vehicle <coughs> in Buddhism, which is Buddhism which takes on many of the practices of Hinduism, including prayer and idolatry. <coughs> and so we have idols of the Lord Buddha to which one plays offerings and prays from this time onwards. <coughs> and then the a stupa, as you represented here, becomes very ornate and highly decorated with lotus leaves on the top and a range of bodhisattvas sitting on different levels around it. Rather like a, a Hindu shrine, isn't it? But it's actually a Buddhist shrine. And here is the typical representation of the Lord Buddha. And that is in Sri Lanka, in Polonaroa, next to a stupa. Now they went further and they not only took over the images, Im imagery of Hinduism, but they took over some of the other ideas of Hinduism, particularly the idea of the sacred mountain. And they started to build at Buddhist shrines sacred mountains. <coughs> Sometimes the sacred mountain has a stupa at the top, but it doesn't necessarily have one, because what it represents is an acceptance of the importance of the creator god, Brahma. <clears throat> now, it's pretty clear we don't have any written evidence of the teachings of the Lord Buddha. We only have the written evidence after his death by his followers and in the next 200 years. But it seems as though the Lord Buddha had rejected the idea of all gods, including a creator god. For, for Buddhism, life and time are eternal. There is no beginning. It is never ending in any direction. So there is no creator. <clears throat> but the idea of the importance of Brahma came, crept back into Buddhism. <clears throat> and so the idea of a creation and of the importance of a creator God begins to be accepted in Mahayana Buddhism. The only God, by the way, that is accepted as a God in Buddhism. And so the stupa is replaced in importance or uh, becomes identical in importance with a sacred mountain, which is a multi-storied tower with or, with or without a stupa at the top and sacred umbrellas. Now here is a, a, an 8th century Hinyana stupa from Sri Lanka, because Sri Lanka or Ceylon did not become, uh, strictly speaking, a Mahayana Buddhist country, but remained a, a Hinayana or Therala country. But the fact is the influences were so strong from other, other Buddhist countries that the, the concessions are being made. So here the platform of the stupa is highly decorated with figures of demons at the lowest level and of bodhisattvas above, and so is decoration carried on into the uh, gallery which is around the stupa, and this gallery was roofed so that you could circumambulate in the shade in this hot climate. And we start to get painted decorations related to these religious sites. So in the monasteries, uh, in the uh, halls of the uh, collection in the monastery, and I'll show you those in a moment, you start to get de uh, wall paintings which are decorated. And they represent the various festivals and pilgrimages of the year. Now, as far as the actual earliest Buddhist buildings are concerned, we know of that are buildings in our sense of the word, we don't have any standing above ground. But archaeology is beginning to reveal them. So here we go back to Buildings built about 200 BC, between 200 and 100 BC, in Sri Lanka. 
<coughs> and these are monastery buildings. <coughs> and uh, this is almost certainly a, a building in which people slept. And there's obvi there obviously was a way of, there was a communal walkway around the courtyard. And then there was a way in which curtains could be used to provide some privacy for sleeping. And it looks as though there were cubicles in which people could sleep uh, in some privacy, perhaps in groups of two or three, we don't know. But notice the perfect shape. It's oriented absolutely correctly. Uh, it is still a religious building, but in the most simple way you can imagine. It's hard to imagine a simpler building for a monastery, is it? Next. When we come to the dining hall of such a building, it is again extraordinarily simple. It has a rice bin that's clear that at the top there where you see there are a number of extra columns. Uh, there, that's clearly the base of rice bins for the storage of rice for cooking. And presumably the cooking took place in the courtyard and this is where they ate. And then there's a sort of ante room, uh, a lobby, for, uh, uh, where you entered. And almost certainly that is where you would wash before eating. Some sort of ablution took place. As I said, we have nothing left of the early ones, except archaeological digs. Uh, but we do have some very old ones. <coughs> this one is 850 years old, and more really, 900 years old. Uh, and it is in Sri Lanka, <coughs> and it is <coughs> a monastery today used <coughs> for the teaching of Buddhist principles. So the old Buddhist monk is on the right, just on the edge of the picture, and two of his acolytes, you can see one of them is quite young, are being taught, who, who are taught. The monastery was originally completely open, like the plans you saw, but some walls have been built later on. Incidentally, the windows, this is from the 14th century, the windows uh, apparently <coughs> were pretty old, uh, we're not sure. But what's interesting is that they needed to be uh, screened or barred in some way, presumably to keep out animals and possibly intruders. But you can see how open it is inside, although there are some, some walls on the sides. And here are these side walls which have been added. But fundamentally, it's very much the same plan as the earlier prehistoric, I'm sorry, the pre, uh, pre-Christian plans that I showed you from 200 BC. Uh, in the courtyard, which is sunken, uh, there are some symbolic rocks, perfect shapes, circular, rectangular, polygonal, representing various values to the Buddhists. The uh, senior monks uh, lived at the entrance end on, uh, in this going in this direction, and the cooking and the junior monks lived at the other entrance. So here is the plan of it. You see how the rooms were added. We believe that there were, no, there were no rooms there originally at all. And there is some evidence for that from some other surviving early monasteries. If they needed a room, it was built as a separate building. And so you have on the axis here on the left another building, which is a treasury for, the, for locking up valuables. So there probably were no rooms in the original building. Of that. The first one you saw was at Mbeka, this one's at Lankatilika. Uh, and again, the side walls are later additions, we think. Not surprisingly, we don't have houses from 2,000 years ago and more. Uh, and not much archaeology has taken place. <clears throat> so we don't know for sure what the plans of the houses were like. Uh, the oldest houses we have record of, and again they haven't been dated carefully, <clears throat> were recorded about 150 years ago by a great scholar called Kumaraswamy, who was the uh, director of the Fine Arts Museum in Boston in America. And Kumaraswamy did record what he thought were the oldest houses. <coughs> and what you can see here 
is that they had a grain store on columns like the ones I saw showed you in the archaeological dig and the courtyard and they were very open except for two rooms. Now whether those two rooms are later additions or not is debatable but we probably have to accept that they are uh, practical additions. One would be for sacred vessels and a treasury and the other would be a dark room for women's childbirth and for the use of women in dressing. Uh, that comes from Hindu tradition, as I told you last week. And so it's quite likely that they are in the original rooms in the house. So the room was completely open except for those two rooms. The, the house was completely open. Well, we can go to n a number of houses today which are very old and have the same basic plan. And here's one. There it has a central entrance. And when you get inside, it has a court with a plant, planted tree in it. But of course, it has uh, additional walls on the side, which are possibly later. Uh, the main family living space is at the back, and there's a rear wall giving out to an open air cooking area. People also dress very simply, as you can see. And all those people live in that house. Uh, what is really interesting is to look at the way the building is built because characteristic of Buddhist architecture is very direct and simple building. So here you see it's a complicated door and it's a double door. But if you think about it, it's amazingly simple. Each door has the hinges, which are pivot hinges, carved out of the same piece of wood. So it's one piece of wood on either side. And then the lock is a double lock a sliding wooden bolt and there's a one single lintel beam at the top into which the two pivots go. I'll show you an even simpler one in a moment. So here's another house which we can date. Uh, I, I did a lot of work on this building and so it's, it was built in the early beginning of the 19th century. So it's not so old but it is a very good example. There's a, the drawings of it are in your handout, uh, in your reader. It has a very simple open plan too, with a courtyard in the middle. And it has rice bins at one end, now screened by a wall, unfortunately. And then it has two rooms, probably the same use as the, as the uh, rooms in the previous, two, uh, previous house, the two rooms. So one would be a treasury and the other one a dark room. Uh, it has uh, a main entrance in this case on the side and the rear entrance for the workmen uh, at the far end, on the right-hand side. The workmen's entrance is screened by a wooden screen, so the workmen leave the implements in, behind that screen at night for the farming. The door on the left is the door into the dark room, and the people slept on the raised platform. You notice how rain dripping from the tiled roof has made this lovely pattern next to the raised platform. Now here's a really simple doorway with three pieces of wood. One door with pivots which are actually carved out of the same piece of wood uh, and then a vertical uh, to lock the door against and a horizontal beam resting on two projecting corbels. It's deliberately simple, isn't it? It's, it's, it's willfully simple to make the point. Uh, now, there's a curious phenomenon going on in a place like Sri Lanka or in uh, Nepal or in Burma or even in Tibet, and that is you're starting to get a mixture between Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, it's inevitable, isn't it, after two and a half thousand years. So the Hindu houses I showed you last week are... They're very old Hindu houses, three or four hundred years old. They can they simply have something of the simplicity of the Buddhist houses, don't they? And the Buddhist houses have a little bit of the complication of a Hindu house. The two uh, religions influence each other. In fact, Mahayana Buddhism is not that different from Hinduism. Both of them are interested in enlightenment. Both of them are interested in studying the whole of creation 
and the whole of eternity. Both of them believe in reincarnation. Both of them believe that salvation comes from escaping reincarnation. They have many, many, very many values in common. The, difference, the main difference is that the Hindus worship many deities, but Brahma is the most important. <coughs> and the uh, Buddhists tend to not worship deities, but simply to pay respect to them. But it's a very subtle thing. Now, what about very big houses? Well, obviously, the lord of the manor, and there were many regions in places like Burma and Sri Lanka where uh, lords grew up who uh, uh, would control vast territories and estates. They would have very large houses. They would naturally be the judges and maintain the law. And they would even perhaps have a small private force to enforce the law. But uh, in order to uh, accommodate all these activities, the house was quite large. So here is such a one called a Walawa in Sri Lanka. It's got some later columns added in colonial times, but basically it's a huge courtyard open house. And the openness you can see on the left very clearly has been somewhat intruded by occasional walls, but fundamentally everybody lived and slept around uh, this courtyard. But because it was such a large scale, the, there is enough room in the covered uh, way for an upper story to be added, a mezzanine floor. And that was very convenient because in the mezzanine level you could actually uh, accommodate things like rice bins. See up high above that entrance there's actually another storeroom and that's a rice bin. I think the problem was that Buddhism really appealed to very deep thinking people and it, they wanted to strengthen their hold on the community by appealing to popular tastes and they felt the only way they could do that was through imagery and, and making the buildings more appealing and making people more aware of the, uh, of the religion, popular people. Well, Buddhists were opposed to uh, institutionalized religions and they were opposed to the caste system. So they didn't want to see it come back, you see. Uh, I didn't mention that, in fact, Buddhism uh, ended in a series of conflicts in India and was effectively uh, exiled from the whole of India by the 800 AD period and was only allowed back in the last hundred years. And now, of course, Buddhists do, pilgrimate, do, do pay pilgrimage to, to Benares and to other shrines uh, from China and Japan and other countries. But for a long time, they were discouraged from doing that by the Indian government, yes. I have a question about the courtyard and the house. So I take it doesn't have any ceremonial purpose in the same way as the no. house? No, no, it does not. No, there's no... There's no formal ceremony originally in Hinayana Buddhism. Everything is internal to you and your own way of doing things and thinking. So there was nothing ceremonial about a house in Buddhism. That's a good question. Any others? <coughs> well, yes. Did they use the courtyard usually for cooking or cooking outside or was it variable? In variable, I think, yeah. Well, I think it's to protect them, perhaps partly, yeah. We're not sure about the big monasteries originally. Uh, well, when you come to Mahayana Buddhism spreading out into the neighboring territories and as far away as Philippines, Vietnam, and uh, Indonesia, and of course I'm not going to deal with China in this lecture, but later on, uh, what happens basically is that you are exporting a, a very ritualistic kind of religion, uh, which has a big appeal to the popular taste. And so uh, the architecture now becomes very demonstrative of sacredness. So the, the stupa becomes a kind of ritual structure in which you have 
uh, a high platform decorated often with sculpture, stepping up to a, a very elaborate sort of stupa. This one has got a strange shape. And then uh, crowned by 13 umbrellas with a great uh, shrine at the top of them. And that's very characteristic of the way Mahayana structures were built outside of India. And similarly, the plan is frequently very elaborate, a whole series of steps up to the central stupa. <coughs> but surprisingly, it gets even more elaborate in Nepal and Tibet, because now you start to identify the stupa with the Lord Buddha himself. And so the shrine at the top of the stupa grows eyes, acquires eyes, which look out at the visitor in a rather forbidding way. And there are an infinite number of uh, smaller shrines around the stupa to bodhisattvas and also shrines to uh, other uh, important dignitaries and so on. Look at the amazing way in which the umbrella is handled, a series of umbrellas at the top. And here's a, a more ancient one, but still with growing the presence of the Lord Buddha in the stupa itself. And I've already talked about in the first lecture about the proliferation of the sacred mountain idea. And of course, the stupa becomes naturally a sacred mountain quite quickly. First of all, executed in stone and brick, and later on executed in wood. So that there begins to be an ambiguous relationship between the 13 umbrellas and the whole of the sacred mountain. Well, here is the proliferation in Burma. This is in Rangoon. And you see the shrines of the bodhisattvas around the base of the great stupa. And then the great stupa, stupa containing the tooth of the Lord Buddha uh, is uh, approached up an infinite number of steps. Uh, and is decorated with, of course, a lotus decoration at the top, and above that, rising straight out of the stupa, the 13 umbrellas, and the whole of it covered with a quarter of an inch of solid gold. Uh, and so, then you can see here the attempts that the Mahayanas are, make, are making to convert ritual structures out of what was meant by the Lord Buddha himself to be unpretential simple reminders of holiness and nirvana. And now they become ritual structures of a monumental size and very materialistic. Now, as I mentioned before, in Java, uh, in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia, Hinduism and Buddhism spread more or less continuously during the first centuries of the present era, of the Christian era. And uh, the result was you get areas which were Buddhist and areas which were Hindu, and there was a lot of conflict between them. And on the whole, uh, Hinduism triumphed. But there were frequently alternating periods. So it's often difficult to separate a Hindu shrine in that region from a Buddhist shrine. But here, you can see we have clearly a Buddhist shrine, for it has a stupa at the top, doesn't it? Uh, and it has also an, a four-axial plan, a biaxial plan. Uh, so it's not approached on a, on a single direction like a Hindu shrine. It's approached from uh, the four cardinal directions. And it has uh, this symmetry which is crowned by the stupa and above it the representation of the 13 umbrellas. So clearly that is a Buddhist shrine in Middle Java from something like the 5th, 6th, 5th or 6th century AD probably. And we have, of course, one of the greatest of all Buddhist shrines in Barabadur. And Barabadur has this amazing approach to the central stupa in which you have, first of all, uh, at the very bottom, uh, two levels of representations of uh, demons from below the earth. And then uh, six levels of representations of lesser uh, 
um, bodhisattvas. Uh, and then, uh, the, focusing on circles, three levels of great bodhisattvas, and then the central stupa, and above it an, a representation of uh, a, a high uh, number of umbrellas. Now let's look at just one detail of that. So each one is actually a Dagaba. Uh, when we go up to Cambodia, where we have the best surviving evidence of these buildings, because they were built in stone in Cambodia, uh, you see, uh, again, this is clearly a Buddhist shrine. Although there is no stupa in the middle, actually it is still biaxial. And uh, you approach up a, through a series of levels of bodhisattva shrines, which in this case are rectangular, uh, but have a multi-story to the roof, to the central shrine of which the top roof is missing and may have had some stupa shape on it. And then we come to the most famous of the great shrines in Angkor Wat in Cambodia, the Bayon. That is famous because it was really, no, there's no, no question it was originally meant to be a Buddhist shrine. And it has an infinite number of uh, smaller shrines to bodhisattvas and a great stupa in the center covered with smaller shrines. And all of them have faces that are thought to represent, that are meant to represent the Lord Buddha, but actually seem to represent various bodhisattvas and possibly members of the royal family. And so there's the approach to that. And you see how the stupa has now been covered with other shrines. And so have the umbrellas at the top. And there's an infinite number of rising sacred mountains representing the smaller bodhisattvas. It's a very beautiful building, but a long way away from the Lord Buddha's conception of what architecture should be. <clears throat> now that's a very quick summary of Buddhism to begin with, but we'll be coming back to it again when we talk to about Chinese architecture and Japanese too. <clears throat>